I want to talk about something that I simply call God's Colossal Generosity Challenge. Would you take a moment with me and, and let's just pray one more time and just repeat this to God after me. Dear God, I open my heart. Speak to me now. I am listening. In Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever known someone who was unusually generous? Would most people who know you well, would they describe you as a very generous person? Maybe you've thought to yourself, well, if I had more, I'd be more generous. Or maybe you've thought, well, if, if God wants to make me more generous, he can simply give me more. But all those mentalities are ideas that, that are really uh, antithetical to what the Bible teaches us about this beautiful subject of generosity. And so we can find ourselves really uh, desiring more and more all the time without the me mentality of God. I want to be a vessel that you can give to me and so everything I have can flow out of me. I don't want to just live out my lives my life uh, just gathering green pieces of paper with uh, pictures of dead presidents on them. Instead, I want to live a life that, that reflects the kingdom of God. You say, well, why is this such an important pass, uh, uh, value for us, such an important topic? You know, of uh, the three core values that this church has of, of bold faith and extravagant grace, one of them is ridiculous generosity. And one of the reasons we're talking about this is because God himself is so incredibly, ridiculously generous for us, towards us. And if you and I will, will be alert to, to uh, recognizing the generosity of God in our lives, it sort of bends our heart to becoming more generous ourselves. You know, the Bible speaks a lot about the subject of money and, and possessions and how we deal with them. In fact, of the 38 parables that Jesus gave, 16 of them are about money and possessions. In fact, in the entire New Testament, one in 16 verses is about money or possessions. And if you looked at the entire Bible from the beginning to the end, you'd see that there are some 500 verses on the subject of prayer including Old Testament and New Testament, maybe just under that, under 500 on the subject of faith, but over 2,000 verses that talk about money and possessions. So, so how we deal with money and possessions, how we think about them, are a reflection of the temperature of our heart towards God. I want to have a heart that's on fire towards God. I don't want to be lukewarm. So I want a heart that can can easily uh, pass on the blessings and the gifts that God pours into my hands so that he would literally pour through them. Years ago, my wife and I were uh, in Israel enjoying visiting the Holy Lands. And one of the things that we uh, did was we visited uh, two different seas. One of the seas was the Sea of Galilee. Beautiful, large sea. It's where Jesus walked on the water. And that, that particular sea is teeming with life and fish, and it, it, it serves as a, as a source of great prosperity to those who live there. Out of that Sea of Galilee in the north, flowing down to the south is the Jordan River, and it flows into the Dead Sea. Now, the Dead Sea is, is one of the saltiest bodies of water on the planet. The Dead Sea has 10 times the normal amount of salt that you would find in typical seawater. And so as a result of that, apart from a few microorganisms and some algae, there's nothing that lives in the Dead Sea. Thus, it's called dead. But the thing that distinguishes it even more so from the Sea of Galilee is that the Sea of Galilee has inflows and outflows. But the Dead Sea only has an inflow from the Jordan River, but nothing flows out of it. Do you know, if you and I are more like the Dead Sea, where nothing flows out of us, 
we take in, but nothing flows out, we become dead and spiritually stagnant as well. So just imagine for a moment, just close your eyes and imagine what your life would be like if you didn't worry about, well, if I, if I, if I give more, I won't have enough. If you didn't get the generosity jitters, imagine yourself for just a moment if you had a certain sort of fearless generosity. Just imagine the Holy Spirit welling up inside of you, creating this, this, this boldness, this, this faith-filled, courageous generosity, this, this contagious generosity that, that is so uh, uh, overflowing in your life that people around you, they, they're almost infected by your generosity like by a virus. It's just, it's catching. And you see somebody else being generous, it makes you want to be generous as well. Let's take a moment and let's look now at our text passage. I'm so privileged to be asked to speak on Malachi chapter 3. And if you have a Bible with you, I invite you to open it up. If not, the, the notes are available to you as well. The Bible has uh, two main parts. The the first part is the Old Testament. That's everything that happened prior to Christ. And, and the second part is the New Testament, everything that happens from Jesus on. And the last book in the Old Testament is called Malachi. And the prophet Malachi was about 400 years before the time of Christ. And the people of God had started drifting from God. They started wandering a little bit away from the, the, the promises and the guidelines that God had provided and so they started breaking commitments that they had. You can read it in Malachi chapter 1 and 2 in the first part of chapter 3. There were business owners who were starting to defraud their, their workers. There were business owners who were starting to cheat their customers. And, and in general, the people had kind of become a little bit distant from God. In fact, so much so that the Lord said, Return to me. And the people said, well, I don't know how. How are we supposed to return? And he said, in your tithes and in your offerings. In fact, some of you are literally robbing me, God said. All this leads us to Malachi chapter 3 and starting at verse 10. It says this, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Stop for a minute and if you're able, I want to invite you to circle the word bring. If you have it in a Bible, if you don't mind doing it, Take a pen and circle the word bring. Some of your uh, Bible apps might allow you to highlight just one, one word. I want you to focus on that word bring, and we'll come back. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord. I want you to circle test me. Circle test me. It says, says the Lord Almighty, and he says, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing. I want to invite you to circle the words that say much blessing. These three areas being circled will be the three focus points for us this morning. It says, so much that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Multiple times he repeats, says the Lord Almighty. He wants you to know this isn't just a word from Malachi. This is a word from the Lord God Almighty. No matter how you slice this passage, tithes are a big deal to God. So God's colossal generosity challenge is really small in its ask, but enormous in its benefits. Okay, your first point is this. God invites us to bring 10% of our increase as evidence that he has 100% of our heart. God invites us to bring 10% of our increase so that he has 100% of our heart. We bring the tithe and offering. Some of you might say, well, I would, I would have to disagree with you, Gary. Tithing is really an Old Testament thing. And I'd say you're absolutely correct. 
In the New Testament, the margin for giving was far more than just a tithe. The word tithe means tenth or tenth part. So if I have $100, I give God $10. It's simple math. In the New Testament, Jesus said, if you have two coats, give one to the other person who has none. That's 50%. Zacchaeus, he said, I give half my goods to the poor. That's 50%. And to the young ruler, Jesus said, go sell everything you have, give to the poor, and then come follow me. That's 100%. (laughs) So again, God's challenge is small in its ask but enormous in its benefit. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying tithing is God's rule. I'm saying it's God's way. So God's way means the tithe comes first. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2. And Greg Wingard uh, referred to this just a, a, a couple months ago when he shared. It says this, On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. Setting aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. So our giving is proportional to our income. Uh, Josh had a problem. Josh went to his pastor and said, you know, pastor, when I made $500 a week, it it wasn't that hard to uh, tithe 10% or $50. He said, but when I started making $5,000 a week, I just... I just, that's a lot of money to give. And would you please pray for me? And pastor came over and he laid his hand on Josh's shoulder and he said, dear God, please reduce Josh's income back down to what it was before so he can afford to tithe. (laughs) You know, the old saying is give according to your income unless God make your income according to your giving. So, So God's way is we bring this tithe. And there's something about bringing it. And it doesn't matter whether we do it electronically or we write a check or cash or any of those kinds of things. There's something about fully releasing it to God. And there's something happens inside of our spirit when we say, God, I'm just bringing this to you. I'm just just placing it in your hands. Everything I have has come from you. Isn't it cool to have a grateful heart? You know, you you start counting your blessings. Instead of seeing what's wrong, we see what's right. Instead of worrying about our shortfall, we worry about how much we're able to sow into God's kingdom. And this this, uh, grateful heart wells up in, in rich generosity, fully releasing it to God. I remember one time I had a person in church. They came up to me and they said, Pastor, I was... I was going by the youth ministry uh, that was taking place and I I saw something I didn't like and I don't really want my tithe going to that. And I said, excuse me, whose tithe? You see, in the Old Testament, the tithe was never spoken of as ours. It was spoken of as God's. So I give it and I entrust God to deal with all those kinds of things. There's this beautiful release that takes place. When I first started uh, tithing, I decided, you know, God, if this is what you want me to do, I'll do it. If this is how you want me to live, I will. When Lori and I got married, we decided from the very beginning, we were going to tithe. And and over all these years, we've been married 41 plus years. And over all these years, honey, we've seen, we've seen tight times, times where there was just a lavish abundance, but we've always seen God to be incredibly faithful. Have we not? God has surprised us. We don't always know where it's going to come from. We don't always know exactly how he's going to be do, going to do it, but just at the right time, God does it. God shakes some resources loose somehow. Years ago, uh, we, traveling was quite difficult for us. I, I didn't, didn't take this powered chair when we travel. It was just a bit uh, too cumbersome to bring it along, and I didn't want it damaged in a cargo hold of a plane. So we prayed and said, God, we don't know what to do. And sure enough, before long, I got a letter in the mail, and it was informing me that, that I had been um, recipient of the will of a great aunt of mine who I'd only met one time. I got a small amount of money, and I thought, wow, that's really cool. I just, I just said, man, it must be from God. And then... 
Shortly after that, a couple weeks later, I get an email from uh, uh, an adult who was once a kid some 30, 35 years earlier in the youth group that I led. And he said, God put it on his heart to send me money to help out with, and the words he used were power wheels. Now, how God moved him to do this, and he moved my great aunt in a different way, <laughs> how, how that happened is, is uh, astonishing to me. But when I added the two together, it came out to the exact dollar amount of the wheels that I had looked up and thought I could use these to travel and, and it would make them just be amazing. And there are many listening today, many listening uh, to this, uh, watching it streaming, that you don't know how God's done it, but you could tell lots and lots of stories about how you brought your tithe to God. And, and it, it comes into his storehouse. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, he says, bring it into the storehouse. You say, what's that? Well, in Israel, the people would bring their tithes to the temple, and every temple had a, a storehouse in it where they would store grain and olives and, and meats that people would bring of their resources and bring them of their tithes. So in a sense, the storehouse today is, is the church. And it says that there may be food in my house. In those days, it was to provide food for those who were uh, the Levites who were serving as priests in the house of God who didn't have another uh, vocation. They were the spiritual leaders and they were providing spiritual food so that when we bring our tithes into the storehouse, we're saying, God, it's fully yours and you're going to provide. The activity of the tithe meant it helped the church do its ministry and its giving to the poor and taking care of those who were voc vocationally in full-time ministry. That's the activity of it. But the purpose of the tithe was that we'd always put God first. So number one, God wants us to, invites us to bring 10% that we might give 100% of our hearts to him. Second point is this. God doesn't demand of us so that we might give to him. He dares us so that we might trust him. He doesn't demand of us so that we might give to him. He dares us so that we might trust him. Trust is like the currency of the kingdom. Trust is, I don't quite see, but I take action based on what I believe, based on what God has shown me. One of the times that our family was on a missions trip in Kenya, my wife and I and our son and daughter, uh, after the missions trip portion where we were doing ministry, we went on a safari. And I remember the guide showing us all different kinds of animals out in the great Serengeti. And one of those was the impala. And I remember him telling us that the impala could, could jump three meters straight up and it could jump 10 meters across, roughly 30 feet across, 10 feet high. And somewhere years ago, I also read that the Impala, as high as it could jump, as far as it can jump, if it's in front of a, uh, about a meter high or a three foot high uh, hedge or bushes, if it can't see what's on the other side, it won't jump. Here it has the capacity to jump high and far, but just because it can't see on the other side, it'll hold back. Wow. See, trust is even when we don't see what's on the other side, we step out and we move forward. Really Look at this that God says. He says, bring this whole tithe into the storehouse. And he says, test me. Everybody say, test me. Test me. He says, test me. In fact, most other places in the scripture, the, the, the Lord says, do not test me. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. But here's the one place I can think of in the Bible where God specifically says, test me in this. Wow. God is not merely suggesting that we give. He's daring us to give. He's imploring us to give. Wow. He says, put me to the test. So our, our trust is measured by the scale of our planting. 
Our trust is measured by the scale of our planting, how much planting we do. We moved here from Nebraska a year and some months ago, and in Nebraska, I gotta tell you, there is a lot of farming that goes on. It is everywhere. You can drive from one end of the state to the other 450 some miles, and you're gonna see a lot of farmland. And I don't know about you, have you ever, have you ever planted in soil that was really impotent? or then planted in soil that was really rich and you saw a lot of great things happen with what you planted? Maybe you say, I live in the city, I've never planted anything. <laughs> the scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6, and Pastor Doug uh, referenced this passage uh, a couple of weeks ago, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but it says this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Do you plant a little or do you plant a lot? You see, the, the, the scale of our trust is measured by the, the, the scope of our, our, our planting. There was a mom who brought her little boy to the store. And when they got to the store, the store owner at the cash register, he held out a, a, a big jar full of all kinds of suckers. And he said to the little boy, you know, take some. But the boy held back. And so the store owner, he just reached in, grabbed a handful and gave it to the boy. And when the mom and the boy got outside, she asked him, why? Why did you hold back? And the little boy said, because I know his hand's a whole lot bigger than mine. <laughs> you know, the same is true with God. God's hands are so much bigger than ours. So often when we pray, our prayers are, are aimed at asking God to reduce the odds against us rather than saying, God, would you do something of, of supernatural proportions that's beyond what we can see or, or even imagine or try to, try to affect by our own uh, human efforts? Yeah. Our trust is reflected in the posture of our heart. So when God says, God says test me in this, it's all about trust. Our trust is, is reflected in how our heart is postured. That very next verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and in verse 7, the Apostle Paul tells the believers in Corinth, he says, don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves one who gives cheerfully. Say cheerfully. God loves it when we give cheerfully. You see, God isn't coming after your money. He's coming after your heart. And he's after your heart so that you would be after his heart. That's your fill-in right there. God isn't coming for your money. He's after your heart. He's after your heart so that you would be after his, his heart. Some of you say, well, Gary, isn't this really not a generosity challenge? Isn't it more of a tithe challenge? And I'd say, oh, no. A tithe challenge is what... Uh, this pastor that I heard about in Oklahoma did. Uh, he said to the congregation, he said, if you give over the next year and you tithe and you don't see every need you have, financial need you have met, the pastor said, I will personally pay you back every penny that you tithe. That's a tithe challenge. So today, I want to make you that same promise. If you tithe over the next year and and you don't see that every need is somehow abundantly met, that pastor in Oklahoma will pay you back every dollar you earn. But, but honestly, see, it's not a tithe challenge, it's a generosity challenge, because God is not just interested in your tithe. God wants you in your spirit to discover his incredible generosity. So the challenge is God saying, test me. Test me here so I can show you an incredible generosity of my heart. Our trust is multiplied by our eagerness to sow into God's kingdom. If you'll jump back in, first, in 2 Corinthians 1 chapter, chapter 8 now, and starting at verse 1, these four, first four verses are just mind-blowing to me. Chapter 8 and verse 1, and I'm doing 
I'm reading it out of the New Living Translation. Paul says, now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God has done in his kindness through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor, but they are also filled with abundant joy. Look at the posture of their heart. This abundant joy has overflowed in rich generosity. That's that contagious generosity right there. They didn't have a lot, but somehow they overflowed in generosity. He says, for I can testify in verse 3 that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. In fact, and this is the best one, verse 4, it says, they begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. Imagine begging, can I please give more? Please, let, let me give more. What an attitude. What a heart posture. You want to have your temperature of your heart warmer? Generosity. It's catching. You read how it's happening there, and you're thinking, man, I want to I wanna catch that virus. Two weeks ago, Pastor Doug reminded us that God doesn't have income shortages or financial needs. So God isn't interested in, in prying open our tightly gripped hands one figure at a time. Rather, he wants our, our hands to be open so that he can pour in enormous blessings that are far more than we could ever imagine. Sometime a couple of years ago, um, we were in a an opportunity season in the church that I was at. And this particular season, uh, we were challenging people to give in a certain way. And to, a, a kind of an over and above gift. And, and we had, Lori and I had prayed about it. And we felt like we had identified a number that we should give. And that amount was roughly equal to a second tithe uh, on top of what we were already giving. And it was this, this generous giving kind of a season. And so we said, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. And then one day we were at a, an all-staff meeting, and just while I was sitting there, I felt like the Lord said, double it. <laughs> double it? But I don't know how, God. I can't imagine doubling it. There's, there's, not, there's not really a way I can see that that would work. So we decided then that well, if God's asking us to double it, we should triple it. Because we wanted to give more than God could ever imagine, uh, more than we could ever imagine. And, and God himself is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can think or ask. We read in, in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. So certainly if God says that he is able to do that, what if we could even do that. And sure enough, by the, when the time was all done, when the three-year giving commitment was over, we realized we had actually tripled it. Now, that's not to, to, to say anything about aren't we wonderful. It's to say, let that generosity bug bite you in your spirit so it, so it overflows uh, on the inside. One time I was thinking, you know, I'm committed to tithing. And if God were to bless me in such a way that someone wanted to give me $10 million with the stipulation that I sign uh, uh, an agreement that I refuse to tithe on the $10 million, would I do it? Would you do it? For years, my answer was no. And then the thought just occurred to me, I could sign that, it agrees not to tithe, because I could double it. <laughs> it's a posture of the heart. Third and final point is simply this. God promises that if we generously rise to his colossal challenge, he will generously meet all our needs and much, much more. God promises if we were generously rise, what God is inviting you to do today is to generously rise to his colossal challenge. It says in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, 
throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there won't be room enough to store it. So God's colossal challenge is, is small in its ask, but enormous in its benefits. So much blessing. What a promise that God gives us. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Doug said that generosity is far more a, a spiritual action than it is a financial transaction. So in that, I want to say this. We don't give generously because God will bless us generously. That would be a financial transaction. And there are motive problems associated with thinking that way. That notwithstanding, that doesn't mean that God doesn't bless us abundantly. And that doesn't mean we don't respond to his promises. We just don't give with the sole purpose of receiving. We give because God promises us abundantly. Look at verse 10. He says, I'll throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there isn't room enough to receive it in Malachi chapter 3. He's saying we will be waterlogged with blessing. We will just be dripping with it. What an incredible promise. In verse 11, he says this of Malachi chapter 3. He says, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. You know what that says to me? That says to me, if I'm, if I'm faithful and, and generous in my tithe, trusting God, that God's going to take care of those times when the enemy comes and tries to steal from us uh, financially. When the enemy comes to try and undermine and, and give us financial challenges and problems that are beyond what we can understand, it says we're going to be protected from those situations. Verse 11, he goes on, he says, The vines in the fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. That means that that we are going to be sustained in our fruitfulness. That means that when we're generous towards God, that he's going to continue to make that which we give to be very, very fruitful. And then verse 12. Verse 12 of Malachi 3, he says this. He says, yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. We will find happiness where we are. We will find contentment where we are. Whenever Lori and I fly, um, because of my situation, they have to load me onto the plane before everyone else. And so I get to watch people as they board a plane. And I remember one day sitting there and watching people grumpy and grouchy and slamming things and complaining about this and complaining about that as they were boarding the plane. And then there was this family that came on, this little boy. He was probably, I don't know, five or six. And he had a completely different posture of heart. He was skipping and jumping up and down. And he was saying, I'm on a plane, I'm on a plane. It was, must have been his first time flying. He's saying, I'm on a plane, I'm on a plane. He found that where he was, was a del delightful place. He was happy where he was, where other people in the same place were miserable and they were unhappy. God says, when you discover this part of my life, uh, of Christian living, God says, I, I want to show you blessings that there won't be room enough to receive it. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. God is able to bless you. Would you read this verse out loud with me? And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. What an incredible blessing from God. If you have a, a handout that you're taking notes on or you have a Bible or other things in your hands, I just want to invite you to set them to the side for a moment as we close. And let's just take a moment now and, and respond in our heart to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. Let's do this. To what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. Years ago, my son Danny, he's in his 30s right now, but 
At the time, he was five, maybe six years old. And I was outside working in the yard and Danny had, he's a very adventuresome young man and, and he had climbed a tree, worked his way over on a branch that was not barely strong enough to hold his weight and the branch bent down. He jumped on top of the shed, the branch lifted back up and he suddenly realized he was stuck. And he's calling me, Dad, Dad, come here. I looked, oh boy, what kind of a dad am I? I let him get stuck on the roof of the shed. He said, help me get down. I looked around. I didn't really see an easy way for him to get down. I said, all right, well, just jump here into my arms. I'll catch you. He said, what if you drop me, Dad? And I said, Danny, I'll catch you. Just jump into my arms. He said, Dad, but, but I don't know. You might drop me. I said, Danny, I'm your dad. Trust me. You can jump in my arms. He goes, I'm afraid. I said, Danny, you can trust me. Jump in my arms. And he jumped into my arms. Some of you today, God is inviting you to take a step of faith, to respond to that, that test me that God is offering you, and to jump into his arms and he will abundantly take care of you. Some of you say, well, that's, that's beyond what I think I could do. A tithe is just, my bills are, I can't do that right now. Well, start somewhere. Start somewhere. Take, take a small step, and then you can take another step, and then you can take another, and you're saying, God, I trust you. There's an old proverb that says, when is the best time to plant a tree? Maybe you've heard this before, and the answer is it's 20 years ago. When is the second best time? The answer is today. I want to invite you right now. Would you take a step today? All across this place. If you're able to stand, I invite you to stand. Let's stand together. Maybe you're here right now this morning, and I want to invite the prayer team to come to the front. Maybe you're here and and you're thinking, God is doing a shaking inside of my heart right now. And maybe you came as a seeker. You were just curious. Or maybe you came as a guest of someone else. You don't normally come to any kind of a church service. And today, God is tugging at your heart. And he's saying, today is a day. God, God really wants not 10% of your money. He wants 100% of your heart. If there's this shaking going on inside of you right now, you're sensing that tug. It's because God is saying, trust me, step into my arms. If that's you right now, you're here in Alamo or maybe you're watching, streaming. If that's you right now, I just want to invite you to take a step. I'm going to pray for you and right where you're at, would you take that step? Heavenly Father, right now I pray for every person who's listening, who's, who's discovering that you love them so much that you gave your only son that whoever believes on him would have everlasting life. Lord, I pray for every person right now who's listening, who's at that point. God, that they open their hearts to you and that they would take that step right now at this moment and they'd become spiritually renewed, brand new, that old things would pass away and everything would be fresh, brand new, a beautiful new start. In Christ's name. Now, if you took that step and you're not here, then I invite you to, to come the very next time the church doors are open. And, and you don't even live here. Maybe you live in another city. Then I invite you to find a good church nearby. If you're looking for a good church, call New Life's church office and we'll help direct you to a good church, a place that believes the Bible and points to Jesus and everything. Now, one more area. If you are at a place right now where you sense the Holy Spirit is nudging your heart in the direction of becoming a generous, generous giver, maybe, maybe you want to pray with me that God would continue this incredible shaking that's going on. And I want to invite you uh, to be a part of this prayer right now. And would you just repeat these words to God after me? Dear God, Shake me up 
so I might shake loose my hold of things on this world. Make me generous. Make me generous beyond my wildest dreams that I might discover your generosity and my heart would be bent towards you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Last thing I want to pray, the worship team can prepare, and that's this. I want you to pray with me for an outbreak, for a contagious outbreak, like we saw in the book of Corinthians, that they didn't have much, but it overflowed. Would you pray with me for this contagious outbreak all across the Bay Area? Let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, we lift up our voices. Come on, church, lift up your voice. God, we pray right now for a contagious outbreak of your spirit all across this Bay Area. Do a new work, we pray. Shake things loose so that your kingdom will be multiplied, so that the name of Jesus will be known. Dear Jesus, right now, we surrender, and right now we make room for you. We make room for you in our hearts. We make room for you in our homes. We make room for you in our finances. We make room for you in our thoughts. We make room for you with our hands. We make room for you in our serving. Oh, Lord God, flow through us not just in us, we don't want to be stagnant, for through us, throughout this Bay Area. We love you and we'll trust you in Jesus' name.